Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro, you got a full house over there. I'm outnumbered. Oh, yeah, we got the bet. We got the dream team here. You know, it's a dream team. Dr. Laura Buchanan is here today, and Dr. Matt Hawkins is here today. So excited! Uh, you know, Dr. Laura has been working uh, here. We're working together for almost a year now, and hopefully soon, also Dr. Matt Hawkins. Just a little bit about Dr. Matt Hawkins. Uh, besides the fact that he's a metabolic health practitioner. Uh, he's also board certified in family medicine and soon to be board certified in obesity medicine. He uh, has published two papers in the space, which are interesting. Uh, well, I think one poster, one paper uh, poster on using CGMs for food addiction and another one using CGMs on uh, outcomes in diabetes. So Dr. Matt Hawkins did his undergraduate uh, degree in physics at University of Florida, his medical school at University of Florida, and his residency at Wake Forest. Uh, he started uh, in, in uh, emergency medicine, but then he saw the light and he came uh, to primary care and family medicine. So we are excited to have him here today. Well, both of them. Thank you guys for having us. Yeah, always a pleasure to see you both. Good to see you, Brian, as well. Yeah, fun stuff. Good to have you. So you're doing a rotation with Tro right now, right, Matt? Yeah, the residency uh, deemed that I could have uh, what Tro's doing. They don't really do a residency. So I had some uh, learning opportunities out here. And it's been a fun week so far. So what's Tro teaching you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not much about how to be a social media punk. I think <laughs> that, was one, that was the first day. We had a whole curriculum on how to aggravate vegans. That was a, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But uh, there was a final exam and everything. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it was, it's, uh, I expected a lot more low carb dogma and things like that. But honestly, I think 10% of the time we spend is actually on the nutrition and 90% of the time is spent on the behaviors we have around food, which is something that uh, I knew about kind of intellectually, but until you start seeing the, the, patient encounters and help, helping the patients with their uh, relationships with foods, it's really hard to get across just how how much you really need to focus on that to help patients. Not not only relationship with food, relationship with people around them and life yeah. and stress and how your outlook on life. All this stuff is so critical that that's why Tro and I have, have really loved what we we're doing because, you know, it's not just about like, I'm just hungry and I'm going to eat or I'm bored, I'm going to eat. It's so much more than that. And, and so... It's hard not to overcomplicate things, but unfortunately, us humans are pretty dang complicated. Yeah, on a lot of the new, like new patient visits that I've seen this week, it's been uh, it's been a lot of the triggers like how how is your stress at home? How's your stress at, at at the job? How's your stress with your family? And then only at the end do you really start talking even about CGM uh, or how to eat low carb. It's really about managing the stress in your life. So you can't just give them a menu and say, just follow this menu and everything's going to be perfect. <laughs> it may work for some people, uh, but I think for, for a lot of people, no, it won't work. And I think it just creates frustration uh, when when people do try that and it doesn't work for them. Uh, that just creates that frustration and starts the or continues the spiral even that people have been in for decades. Yeah. Yeah. Tro, jump in here, man. Yeah, I, I want to know how this all started. So yeah, you're here in our clinic. You're you're. I mean, you've learned. I know from. I think uh, I forget if you went out to visit Mark Cucuzella. I certainly know you went to Dr. Eric Westman, and now you're here. But you know, you there's something that brought you into medicine. I mean, from what I remember, you grew up in sort of rural Florida, and no doctors in your family. So you're the first doctor. I mean, I want to hear. Like, you know, what Big Cock, you know, uh, how he started saying, well, maybe I should go into medicine. And, uh, you know, because I don't think it was such a linear path. I mean, so I just want to hear, like, what was your first, you know, sort of uh, uh, idea? When did it hit you that, you know, I, I want to become, you know, we, we are, it's a sacred profession. Mm -hmm. You know, we are really, uh, we have a 
you know, a lot of responsibility and a lot of, it's a gift to do what we do. So what was like that? What made you, what was your calling? Yeah. The, you hit the nail on the head earlier, basically summed up uh, my entire life in about those three sentences. Uh, I started with physics in undergrad at University of Florida and I loved it. I was actually going to go get my PhD in physics and I, I really just like the problem solving. And that's the entirety of any of those hard science fields. You're going to, you're going to come across a problem and you can spend uh, days to months or even like eight years to get your PhD on it. Uh, but then I think one day in the lab, I just realized that the problem solving was great. There wasn't a lot of the, I didn't feel like I was doing the greater good. And I definitely wanted to talk to people more than I was doing. And I shadowed a couple of physicians and realized that medicine has that. And I shadowed a great humanistic doctor. And that's what kind of set me down off this path. Uh, switched really late into undergrad, uh, finished all my prereqs in like a super senior year, my fifth year and uh, applied to med school and thankfully got in. And that's where I met Laura, uh, which is certainly like the best thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, we, I was gung ho on EM from the get go emergency medicine, which is a great field. It's probably one of the most uh, high volume problem solving fields you can get. Uh, but we got interested actually through the low carb MD podcast in kind of metabolic medicine uh, in third and fourth year. And I already applied to EM by then. So maybe you know, we could go into have our own telehealth practice and I would be doing part-time EM and doing all these other things. And so eventually we got into residency. Laura was coming home and giving me these awesome stories about taking people off of insulin or improving A1Cs in a residency clinic from 12% down to 6%, which is just crazy. And it's not something they teach in, in med school. In med school, diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. You're gonna go on metformin now you're going to go on GLP-1 and SGLT-2 and then eventually lead insulin and eventually amputations and all of the, the bad things that are at the end of diabetes from what they said. So I realized, I think you said this like in another podcast, Brian, too. I was downstream. I was, I was basically in the river trying to pull people out in EM and I wanted to be a few thousand yards upstream or that's where I wanted to be in medicine. That's why I went into medicine to to keep people out of the emergency department decades before they would have shown up. So it's hard to switch residencies. That was a pretty hard time in my life, but uh, I made the switch, have never been happier and I'm doing what I love every day. And I wanna do this for the next 50, 60, uh, hopefully 80 years. <laughs> Brian, can you hear me real quick? I just wanna, I just wanna uh, uh, point out that he went to Low Carb MD Podcast University. That's where he got his training. <laughs> So yeah. he got his first training at low. Does that make you proud a little bit? I gotta be honest. Yeah, it makes me I, a little bit proud, Brian. You know, I met these two at a conference. I'm trying to remember which one it was. Was it Denver that we, we talked a little bit? I think that was the low car Boca 20. Oh, Boca 20. Oh yeah. Jeez. Yeah. 20, yeah. 2022. 2022. That was and, the day my life changed too. That's when I left my standard practice right after that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it, I think having, you know, that's what I really like about the space is I, I am very optimistic for the future to help other people like that was in my position to get to where I am today. Uh, it was very random to have first like come across your podcast, uh, but through the work of even the SMHP and your continued work on the podcast, it's just it's reaching a snowball's kind of critical mass, a threshold to where uh, more people are interested in this. And I can even... We've talked to a lot of my co-residents about low carb uh, and ha in general cardiometabolic health, and they're all fairly they're on board. Like they're they're not totally uh, they're not totally into the low carb space, but they're at least it's a reasonable option for a lot of their patients. Where I don't think we were at that place even a decade ago, even a few years ago. Yeah. When we started this podcast, it was taking a risk. I'm like, are you sure you want to do this, Tro? I knew Tro's story. And I was like, okay, you have a great story, but man, you, you run risk because once you run up against the establishment, you know, things can get very, very ugly very quickly. You probably regret that now. I mean, even Laura was like, Tro, you know, you may want to tone it down on Twitter or just a little bit. I don't know who's been censored more. Me I've been saying that. I've been censored more for sure. But because I was crazy enough to have doctors on to talk about their real life experience. And I think that's the key is like, you could be theoretical all you want until you get into the clinic and see what's happening. I have a case right now, Tro, 
it's mind blowing. She's mind blowing. I mean, I'm looking at her sugars and she's coming off her insulin. She's doing everything right. And she has tons of health problems that have precluded her from getting healthy. And she's a machine. And and I'm looking at these numbers and I can't even believe it. I, I was tearing up when she came into my office and follow up because I was like, because she came in the first time and said, you're my last chance. I'm if if you can't help me, I'm going back to Coke, Coke and donuts and cake. Right. She goes, nothing's working. And she was trying to vegetarian approach and vegan approach and all these different things. And nothing was working. And her insulin was going up. She gained 25 pounds. And this poor thing was on a disaster course. And you see her sugars going off the scale on the CGM. You could even see them. At the, they were off the top. Now her sugars are better than most of my patients in it like that while coming off medications. And you see this and you think, man, these guys who are saying, you know, if you eat an egg, it's like eating, smoking five packs of cigarettes or whatever they want to say. It's just amazing when you, when you can see it. And that's why I'm excited about Matt's work with the siege continuous glucose monitor, because when you see it, a lot of people, it's either they're accountable to us and they don't want us to see it. Number two, they're a They look at and go, I don't like to see my sugars go to 400. I don't like to see that. And so they change their, what they're doing and they realize certain things they thought was good was not good. Right. And so they can make those changes. So I'd love to hear Matt, what, what, what you're, what you're came up with, with your, with watching this continuous glucose monitor and food addiction. Yeah. We, uh, Laura and myself, I think I was an intern at the time. So the way residency works for people who don't know, you go through four years of med school and then you'll apply to and get match into a residency, uh, for family medicine in general, internal medicine, it's about three years. Some can be as long as seven years if it's a surgery. Um, but during my intern year, which is the first year of your residency. And I think that's during Laura's second year, we started a project where we took group medical visits. So we had seven, uh, subjects. Cause when you go into a research, uh, space, the patients turn into subjects. Uh, and we talked uh, to them about low carb options in this group medical visit setting, along with using CGMs. So we would uh, meet them every two weeks, we would have seven sessions with them. So it took a total of 14 weeks. And we had two uh, serial uh, groups. So we had 14 weeks for the first one took a little break, and then 14 weeks for the second one. And we basically taught them only how to just use their CGM and how to keep the line flat. And we didn't change any medicines. That was part of the, that was part of the protocol is we could not change any of their uh, glycemic medications and none of them were on insulin or, or any of the other medicines that would make them go too low and just empowering the patients through showing them what their own glucose, their own sugar did uh, improved their A1C by half a point. And these were patients that had diabetes for, for years. I think our average length of diabetes in the study was probably four years, but I know we had somebody who had diabetes for like 15 years at that point. And it just gets really hard to improve, uh, in some people in A1C that much, but they, they did it. They found what foods would raise their sugar and thus raise their A1C and by themselves, just with a little bit of knowledge from us, they did it, which was inspiring because in, in medical school, it, I think that there, there's a lot of the talk like, oh, patients, uh, a lot of the me uh, other medical students, um, there's a lot of negative talk about patients and how they don't want to improve. I just think we have the entire wrong messaging for patients. Patients want to get better. People want to get better. They want to live a long, healthy life and they want to play with their grandkids and they want to be able to bend down in a full squat and pick their grandkids up when they're 80 and they're 90. Um, and when you give them the tools to do it, they succeed. It's just how we as physicians uh, give them the tools. And so that's, I think that was the takeaway from the study is that if you can, if you can empower patients, they can do it pretty much by themselves. The food addiction, uh, part of it was interesting. We gave a, it's a survey called the YFAS, which is the Yale food addiction survey. And we gave them at the beginning of the study and the end of the study. And essentially it walks through problems like, do you have shame about eating? Do you have guilt about eating? Uh, have you ever experienced this while you're eating? And all of the metrics of the food addiction survey improved by the end of the study for how many patients? Yeah. Yeah. So seven patients qualified as having food addiction symptoms. So one was severe, one was moderate, and four were mild. And all of them went to having no food addiction symptoms at the end of the study. That's really wild. That's really wild because, you know, so many times, I know Tro's heard the same thing is that, 
you know, people will, you know, specialists will say, you know what, like, if you restrict people, it's going to get worse. That's what they say. It's like, what are you basing that on? Because that's like me saying, hey, if someone has a problem with alcohol, if we limit their alcohol, get rid of alcohol, does that mean they're more likely to binge on alcohol? No, you're less likely. So a lot of it has to do with our attitude towards it too. And when we start having success and, 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 and you brought up so many good points, one is that we all thought that, that no one's listening to us. And, you know, like the great Dr. Unwin, when he was talking, saying, hey, you know, none of my patients are listening to me. He was frustrated with them, but it was really our management that was the problem. And once they changed the management, then all of a sudden his patients became brilliant. I think Tro brought up a good point yesterday or two days ago. Uh, there's really no auditing service for physicians. How do we have feedback on how we're, how, how much good we're doing for our, our patients. Uh, we have metrics, like there's surveys, some companies will hand out to say how impressed you are with your physician. But if I'm not improving my patients A1Cs and helping them decrease their risk of heart attacks and helping them live the longest, healthiest life possible, why, why even, why even do this? There's, there's no, we don't have a, a way to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the big things that I, that when I got out of the system at Tro's uh, urging, or forcing me out of the system was really, and I'll, and I'll tell you a story about that if we have a minute, but, um, you know, I started seeing that, like I started seeing that the insurance company were saying, look, here's a quota. If X number of your patients aren't, don't have a certain treatment, right. If they don't have this treatment and, and without looking say that patient doesn't need it, they're not diabetic anymore. Their sugars are normalized. Why do they need to be on a statin drug, for instance, you know, things like that. And you start getting penalized for not doing what they tell you to do. And you're, you know, it's one of those things where you lose, I, during this whole COVID thing, I, I received a lot of patients because their doctors were hounding them on certain issues, right? And they would just hound them and hound them and hound them. And it's like, why are they hounding me so hard? And then you find out there was a financial incentive. So what they did is they fired these patients because they would miss their quota if they had these patients that were messing up their bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so we were happy enough to take those patients in and 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 uh, support them in, in their autonomy and understanding medicine. So what I'm getting at is, is it's a big system and it's really, really tough. And, and a lot of the doctors don't have the freedom to speak. Like, you know, if, if you talk low carb at certain big institution, you're out, you're done. <laughs> like, you can't talk about that. So it's amazing as these younger docs, like you come up through the ranks and say, hey, look, here's my data, right? The data doesn't lie. We have the data. And that's what Tro's doing such a great job of, you know, getting all this data put together so that we can release studies. I want to talk a little bit about that because, you know, I think the four people in this room are probably looking at the forefront of that. You know, you know, we've been working with, you know, large employers and um, we've been showing that, you know, using CGMs, using asynchronous sort of education, our app, our, you know, using a low carb, a low carb approach, empowering patients to reach out to text message, right? Um, you know, our office, you know, we are seeing incredible results. You know, we were reviewing, you know, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Laura helped us review our one year data. At one year, the average person, you know, in our employee wellness program lost 51 pounds. At, and at six months, it was like 34 or 38 pounds, something like that. And then at three months, it was 21 pounds on average, right? With and this is while stopping more meds. We published a list of the medications we stopped. The, the list was like a mile long. It was like three columns, an entire slide. We started, I don't know, it was like six or seven medications, right? And we lowered their, you know, AHA, American Heart Association, ACC, cardiovascular risk by 44%. And the thing is, is, you know, we're saving, they're happy, they're empowered. And so, you know, this is the forefront, the four people here, you know, we're probably at the forefront. I mean, yeah, there's Verda, certainly there's the unwinds across, uh, the, across pond, the pond, yeah. you know, but we are at the forefront. And if you're listening to this and you're, you're an employer or you're, you're somebody in a, in a, you know, who has access to an HR department, go give them our podcast, say these people are changing people's lives and they're getting people healthy because that's. You know, that's really like we have uh, we have to help like our entire country is suffering. Diabetes, obesity, uh, we are suffering. And, and this is something I talked to Matt about earlier. And uh, I'd love to hear his opinion. You know, how do we become better as physicians? You know, how do we take sort of where we are and improve? And, um, you know, 
just honored to be working with them, Dr. Laura, for over a year, and hopefully soon also Dr. Matt. Uh, and I'm going to let them sort of chime in on this. Um, do you want to answer that question yeah. first before? Because I, I just want a quick tangent. So one of the things that I think from Tro, the app, Brian, you're doing and your patient you mentioned earlier on in the podcast that is so important is empowering people to take their own metabolic health into their hands and really giving them the knowledge that they need to improve their life. And one of the great tools, and we've talked about it in our study, and again, we weren't focusing necessarily on even teaching people about food addiction, actually. like that, We just did the pre and post survey without telling people food addiction exists. And, but using the CGM, changing their diet, those things got better. So the CGM can be an incredibly useful tool and I think right now with, in the United States adult population, over 38% of people have prediabetes, over 11, maybe even higher now actually, a percent of adults have type 2 diabetes or diabetes. With that large of the population having insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, continuous glucose monitors gives the person that knowledge, what exactly they're eating on a daily basis is doing to their body. And I just made a tweet about this and from someone who does not have diabetes, but I sent in a prescription for a continuous glucose monitor. They ate some raisins and their sugar went to 200. And I got pushback saying, you're just making them scared of a healthy blood sugar spike. It immediately came back down. And a blood sugar spike to 200, we don't know in the medical field yet currently what a true, quote, healthy normal blood sugar spike is. But up to 200, I would bet a lot of things that that is not a healthy blood sugar spike. And if that individual became one of the 38% of U.S. adults that did have prediabetes, they could very quickly say, oh, wow, look at that. Raisins took my sugar to 200, probably contributing to my prediabetes. Let me remove that from my diet. Without that, they could continue eating that food thinking they're consuming maybe even a health food. Some people think Raisins are probably a healthful snack for kids, for, for anyone. So we just really, I think there needs to be less pushback against these devices that are teaching us about our body. It's good to know what's happening. People are using sleep devices now, other types of monitoring things, helping with their physical activity. Yeah, and I think that's an important caveat too, is that you need people who understand that continuous glucose monitoring. Are all spikes bad? No. Like, you know, we just had Andrew Kutnick on who's, who's doing some great research, type one diabetic, and he has to shoot extra insulin before he does high intensity interval training, right? Because his sugars go crazy high. So people think you have to carb load that exercise. You don't, <laughs> you really don't. If you, if you can get to your fat stores and, and your energy taps. So it's really critical. That's why when we follow the continuous glucose monitor, we have people log. I was stressed that day. I didn't sleep well. I got into a fight with my husband, you know, all those things. So we could say, oh, okay, that's how you respond. I just have a guy, he just got back from Cabo, high stress job working for a huge firm. And he took a week off with his wife and reconnected, ate terrible food the whole time. He goes, I lost almost five pounds <laughs> in a week. And, and so it, it really does have, we have to look at the, this whole metabolic health, stress, sleep, you know, hating the world, all these things. It's not just what we're eating. Yeah, and I'm a... I'm a very research oriented guy. Uh, I was the same way in undergrad and I tried to, to do the same in medicine as well. Uh, actually yesterday or two days ago, there was the CGM map was published out of Israel, a group from Israel, which had 7,000 healthy CGM users. And they basically looked at a, a ton of the metrics, like a lot of the glucose variability, which would be your glucose spikes and a lot of your baseline glucose. And uh, they're going to be following these patients subjects prospectively for 25 years. And I think that is like one of the most exciting things that is happening here as well, because we truly don't know. We, we, we have prior to this, a lot of our research was based on the nutritional epidemiology. But when you start talking about CGM epidemiology, you're going to be able to just basically measure the exposures that much more precisely than whatever you could be doing in nutritional epidemiology. And I think that's the thing that makes me most optimistic. Going back to your question, Brian, what can we do to, to get basically help more physicians get into this space or this mindset? And it comes back to the research. Uh, for instance, Unwin's paper published earlier this year, I think it was 40% of patients in his practice that chose low carb 
went into remission with their diabetes. And in the first year, that was up to something crazy like 80 or 90%. Uh, to me, when that paper was published, that should have been, that should have put out the call that in every clinic, there needs to be like a little red flashing light when somebody gets a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Like every prim primary care clinic in this country should have like a SWAT team dropping down from the drop down ceiling and you should be mobilizing clinic resources to get these like to improve their A1C and yet nobody, nobody batted an eye. It gets harder the longer it goes. That's what this paper showed. We've showed that we have an intervention that you can do in a general GP practice, which is what we do here, which is what you do, uh, Brian. And it's what people do that listen to this podcast. And yet it didn't really move the needle it, at, at all in really mainstream medicine. But the hope is I know of the study. We know of the study. The study was published there's going to be a critical mass where enough medical students are going to learn about it. Enough of the younger physicians are going to learn about it. They're not going to be kind of set into stone by the old paradigm. And they're going to really realize that what we were taught in medical school, diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. Why, why would you want to learn nutrition if that's the end stage of one of the most debilitating nutritional diseases there is? We know that's not true. We can put diabetes into remission. Once you tell medical students that it gets them more interested and it has them practicing that in clinic and patients can improve their health. Well, and that's the thing is it's so frustrating. And I know Troll gets heated. We talked about him getting censored a little bit, maybe even using four letter words every now and again. But I get it. The sentiment is like, look, Dr. Unwin just published something and the doctor says, you know what? It's all genetic. It has nothing. What you do, lifestyle has nothing to do with this. And you go, you're just predisposed. That's like saying you're 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 just gonna get cancer, so don't even try to prevent it. <laughs> it's 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 that mindset that's so damaging and this chronic progressive disease. We were all taught that. Chronic progressive yeah. disease. And they're they're just gonna get worse, you're gonna get amputation, the next step and the next step, and we know what comes. And so that's why we get emotional. Like for me. My patient, I'm like, I really don't care about the weight. I really care about getting the insulin right and the sugars right and bringing those down. Everything else follows. But the other point that you raise that's so critical is that with what we're doing with the continuous glucose monitor of saying, what did you eat on Wednesday? Because we go back a week and I ask people, what did you eat last week? And they don't remember. But at the moment, it was the most important thing. But when they have it on their continuous glucose monitor documented, then it's not saying, hey, how many times have you had orange juice for the last six months? I know it because I have it on the continuous glucose monitor. And they put it at the time, right? So if they're if they're honest in their answers and, and, and put that on there, we have a great retrospective to look at right now to say how many times you've eaten steak in the last two years. Like, who knows? I don't know how many times I had steak in the last two years. And people just make up answers like, okay, this is the epidemiology. This is the study. It's crazy. I highly recommend anybody listening to this. Laura and I are making a nutrition curriculum for medical students and residents for uh, the SMHP, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. And one of our modules, uh, I have a couple of videos about food frequency questionnaires and nutritional epidemiology. I just want you to go uh, type into Google dietary uh, health questionnaire three, and there's a free PDF, 144 questions. Uh, that is a food frequency questionnaire. It's what the NHANES was based off, based off of, I believe which is a very large and a perspective cohort study that we use for a lot of data and just try to fill it out. You know, it takes about 45 minutes. So it is a sizable chunk of your life, but know that that's what this data is based off of. And basically hundreds of thousands of people filled this out. And that's what we have a lot of our recommendations, our dietary guidelines based off of coming from a field like physics. Uh, when I, you start reading into the way the like just the, the recommendations we make to our patients now and what the underlying research is, it's, uh, it, I can't, I can't, you just, you cannot make recommendations based off that data. You can meta-analysis all you want. You can put as many studies as you want together, and you're just going to be showing the bias inherent in the actual questionnaire itself. Um, and then going back to the, the genetics question, I know that's also a, a hot topic. The, one of the USDA guidelines for 2025 to 2030 uh, one of the chairs said famously, I think in a 60 minute interview that, uh, obesity is a genetic disease. And it's kind of like, I, my analogy for that is asking, well, how does a car move? How does a car go forward? How does it go into reverse? And it's like a mechanic saying, oh, it has explosions. And it's kind of like asking that for a researcher. Well, what makes, what, why, why does obesity happen? Why does type two diabetes happen? Well, it's because of genetics. And 
both questions can be technically right. There can be genetic predispositions, but the the answers actually serve to just totally, I would say, obfuscate the entire the entire description, the entire discussion. As soon as you say that a car moves by explosions, what are you going to talk about next? And as soon as you tell a patient that obesity is genetics, how are you going to counsel that patient in order to an, improve their health? It's it's pretty much a non-starter. And I think that's why it makes me so frustrated is that you should know better. If it's if disempowering. it's disempowering. Yeah. 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 It's disempowering. It, if you have um, only five seconds to give a soundbite, you should just say, obesity is complicated. If you have more than that, then you can get into the nuance. But just saying that does a huge disservice to everybody. I think it is to say that we can use medications. I, <laughs> That's, yeah. uh, you call it genetic and say we have medications that can help. That's, yeah. Hammers and nails, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I think, unfortunately, we're a microwave society, you know, and so people want to plant a seed today and have a tree tomorrow, or they want to, you know, like, uh, squeeze grapes today and you have wine tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. So that's the hard part. And that's what we're dealing with is, is this mindset of, hey, my friend lost 20 pounds in a week, so I'm going to do the same. It's like, well, it doesn't quite work that way. You know, I, I used to think that I used to think that, um, you know, like, yes, it's true that m many people want shortcuts. We all dream about, you know, winning the lottery. Yes, it's true. You know, people, you know, throw something in gambling because they think they're going to win or they bet on sports or, you know, uh, but I think most people understand, at least at this point, when it comes to obesity, that there's no gimmicks. It's been 70 years our population has struggled. And so I think they're desperate. I think it's a desperate population. I think it's a vulnerable population. They have tried and failed everything over the last 70 years, calorie counting, supplements, go low, you know, lap bands. Remember, Brian, when lap bands were the cure for obesity, we're going to solve every problem with obesity. We just get a lap band. It's reversible. You don't have to do any surgery. You just cut it in and out and it's fine. It's going to be little. And what happened? They, all, they developed alcohol use disorders. None of them worked. Their lap bands are in there. They're getting them removed. I mean, the, the new class of medications that are coming out, you know, we've already seen what's going to happen, right? We've seen two-year data where the cravings are going back to normal, their hunger is going back to baseline, and their relationship to food, and it basically stops working. So after six months, well, what are you going to do, right? After six months to a year, the weight's starting to come back. And if you stop, the weight comes back you know, and then some, particularly if you've lost your lean mass. So I'm, I, I think that this population is vulnerable. I think people want it. They just want to know exactly what to do. And, and nobody's giving them concrete answers. You have people from the USDA well, you there know, are committee true. saying that it's genes and drugs, you know, and then you have other people on that USDA committee saying that, you know, it's, you should eat ice cream because ice cream prevents diabetes and meat's really bad and Cheerios and tricks are healthy foods. This is what they're telling you. The whole point of this, and I'm gonna stop hammering away, I think is to basically take advantage of a, a really vulnerable population and to keep them confused. And whether it's an ex explicit or implicit goal, I'm not sure, but you know, my patients come in, people, I would have cut off my pinky when I was 350 pounds to have a normal relationship with food and be a normal weight, I would have cut off my pinky and I haven't met somebody who wouldn't have. I literally, literally we just had somebody who was basically in tears saying, it's not just me, it's my son. And I don't know what to do. I've tried everything. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, when we say we don't have the solution, we just had Dave Dana on, right. He just shows up at the gym. He just shows up every day. He goes, I don't work out for five hours. I don't do this. I'm just, He's staying the course. He's almost 100 pounds down. So what I trust him as an expert on how to make these things getting better, right? And say, just show up, just make these changes, get rid of the really, really bad stuff. And then at the end, you kind of fall to whichever end of the spectrum you feel the best. I mean, this this whole thing, like we talked about, uh, you know, physics and being a scientist. Some of my favorite patients are mechanics. Mm -hmm. Because they get it. They're like, okay, if this doesn't work, this doesn't work, you change this variable. Then if that doesn't work, you change this variable. Then we, we can narrow down what the problem is. We're doing the same thing. We're just using a, a little bit more complicated machine with the human body. But it's that mindset where, unfortunately, and that's why I'm so happy to hear you both going into this kind of medicine, is there's a cookie cutter approach to medicine now. 
this number is this, you treat with this med. Your blood pressure is this, you treat with this med. Then here's the, the paradigm of steps that you go through. When that doesn't work anymore, then you go to the next med, the next med, the next med, and never look at the root cause of, okay, why is the blood pressure high? Is that natural? No, it's not. Exactly. I think uh, to give some background for people who are listening to this too, uh, just to talk about the incentives right now in medicine, uh, the way most physicians are paid in a clinic is by RVU based, which is their relative value units. So you basically have a couple of different um, a couple of different levels for your clinic visit. You can have a one through five and nobody really does the one or the two, but really three, four or five are the increasing levels of complexity and also increasing amount of money you get back. So I think I looked it up this morning and it was 1.3 RVUs for a level three visit and uh, about 2.1 RVUs for a level four visit. And then level five visits aren't really that common unless you send somebody to the hospital or you bill by time. But the moral of the story is that when you go from a level three to a level four visit, you get more money. And the only way to really go f to increase the complexity is by increasing the medical decision making, which is in general medication. So when you have 15 minute medicine, which is kind of, I think of 15 minute medicine as stuck between the two pillars of the food industrial complex and the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Uh, I, I truly believe a lot of physicians out there, they want to do the right thing. Burnout is ultra high. People want to do the right thing for their patients. They're seeing all these bad outcomes for their patients. Uh, you have Ozempic coming around and, and be basically saying it's the cure. Manjaro is now the cure. We used to have the lap bands. There's always the, the cure right around the corner. And those things are easy to do in a 15 minute visit. Um, you have just enough time to really ask about the side effects of the medications and the risks and benefits of a new medication. And then they can come back in a month, but it doesn't treat, it doesn't help the underlying cause of what is going on. None of those really do. And that's why being here for a week with Tro, like I said, I thought it was going to be a, uh, I thought it was going to be a, uh, uh, a lot of, oh, low carb, you should not eat this, you should eat that, or you should follow this page more. But in reality, it's 10% of somebody's what they're eating. And it's 90% of what's around them and their relationship with what's around them and their food. Yeah. And the situations you put yourself in lifestyle, family, friends, relationships, all this it is really, really complex, but it's simple too. At the same I, time. I just want to, I, I want to harp on this because, because, you know, we were talking about this today, Matt, actually, and I just want to like bring it up and Laura, I, I know I've talked to Laura about this, you know, uh, we, you know, Matt, you just spent about, two minutes, three minutes talking about a medical billing system that's imposed on doctors. Okay. And, uh, and we have to learn this system so that we could send bills to insurance. Right. And you, you like rattled this off like the, like any resident could right, in residency clinic, right. Because they start to talk to you about coding and billing. Right. And just before this today, we were talking about the concept of moment zero. Right. This concept of, you know, there is somebody out there who has a medical issue and the goal of every doctor should be to get as close to that serious medical issue as possible, to be so reachable, to be so trusting, to be accessible and and have a great rapport that if a patient has an issue like chest pain or or numbness on one side of their face and, you know, uh, or slurring of the speech, they could get a doctor and get insight as close as possible, right? Or if somebody's going to make a that moment zero of a lifestyle choice, they're going to eat something, they're going to feel terrible, they're going to have a bad relationship with food, they're going to eat off plan for a week, right? And a week becomes, a, you know, a month and a month becomes a year and they've gained 30 pounds back. If our job as doctors is to get as close to possible as that moment, right? How come we haven't devised systems to do that? Like you, we, you're here rattling off and I, and I'm not, I was the same, like, I'm not blaming you, but it's, this is a systemic problem, right? How do we get our doctors to think, what does my patient need so we can prevent the worst case scenario? So we could become so accessible, so trusting, so amazing that they could text or they could go on an app or they could, you know, we're already seeing it happen as it's going on and we can reach them in that moment or as close to that moment before the five years of shame and the hundred pounds of well, weight gain. Uh, 
Well, the problem becomes we have we have a conflict of interest in this way in medicine is if I prevent someone from getting diabetes, I don't get to put that diabetes code on my chart and I don't get paid as much in the standard care. So the more sick that person, that person gets an amputation, oh, we get a big bonus, right? Ultimately, in, in standard medicine, we don't throw. Our job is to keep people safe now and say, hey, look, I don't want you to be, because guess what? Like a patient yesterday, I go, you get your lifestyle right. You'll never have to see me and I won't have to see you. We all, we're both happy, right? I yeah. mean, I like spending time with you, but we could talk about sports and, and the family, right? We don't have to talk about, oh my gosh, we're going to have to, you know, address this wound that you have that won't go away that we're trying to fix. And I'll send you to, to, you know, 12 specialists trying to fix this thing. So the, this short sightedness. And, and again, when you're seeing patient after patient after patient, it's really hard because I was killing myself in the system because I was doing this kind of medicine in that system. It doesn't work. You can't spend an hour with every patient and get paid for a 15 minute visit, right? A code you can't code for, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to keep these people off diabetes uh, medicines. And also, as we see that that insulin go higher and higher, we know what's coming. Diabetes is coming. It's in your. It's not going to reverse unless you change what you're doing, including stress, lifestyle, all these other things that we talk about. So there's so much that really, no, there was no, I, I can honestly say this. I have zero type two diabetics in my practice. That I didn't warn it's coming. I'm telling you it's coming. It, it, it's, it's, if your insulin is running at 58 all the time and your A1C is creeping up, you're in trouble. Like it just hasn't happened yet. You haven't got the diagnosis, but it is, it's here already. Right. So I think those kind of people that we can intervene on. Now we see that they have normal A1Cs and their insulin is normal and they're metabolically healthy now and they're feeling great. It, it's such a big, big picture that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a frustrating conflict of interest that we have in medicine right now. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. I want to, I want to put myself out of business. And, uh, I think of medicine as the conduit or we talked about, I have the, my, my mental model is you have the food industrial complex on one side, which has record profits year after year. And then you have on the other side, the pharmaceutical industrial complex, which again, record profits, the medicine, the medicine complex is in the middle and it helps kind of facilitate the money between the two. Uh, and also record profits. And also record profits. I mean, it's this is truly one of the largest redistributions of wealth in this country that we've ever seen. And it's off the backs of the people getting sicker. Uh, last time I did my 24 hour shift uh, in the hospital, which is the last, tw last 24 hour shift I'll ever do unless Tro says otherwise. <laughs> um, at 2 a.m., I had to go admit a person to the hospital that had a diabetic foot ulcer. And he ended up having a necrotizing fasciitis. And thankfully, we they recognized that in the ED, very smart uh, people, and they mobilized the operating room. And he went back, essentially, uh, emergently to the podiatry OR, to the foot OR, to do an urgent debridement as far up as they needed to go. And if we had intervened on that person a decade or two decades ago, I mean, even if you intervened on him, if, even if you helped him uh, with a really... A, a, a in-depth, comprehensive care solution, even six, six months prior, he would still have diabetes, but he wouldn't have had the foot ulcer. We That OR would not have been operating that night. And if you don't operate that foot OR, then how are you going to bill for anesthesia? And how are you going to bill for those people are on call? The the podiatrist, the, the foot surgeon is making money. The anesthesiologist is making money. The nurse, the head nurse uh, anesthesiologist is making money and all of the scrub techs are making money overnight, but the hospital is losing money because they're paying those salaries. The only way the hospital recoups their money and makes money is if that OR is running at 2 a.m. on my last 24 hour shift. And so that's, I just, I don't want that. Like if I can put 90% of what they do in the hospitals out of business, that's my goal. Yeah. And the hospital can't run on empty hospitals. They yeah. can't survive. So that there, there's definitely conflict of interest there too. But obviously, you know, there's a lot to work on. And and that's what I was seeing. At the, and, and, you know, my big aha moment really was I met with one of the heads of the HMO before I, right when I resigned, he goes, Brian, are you okay? Are you going through a midlife crisis? Why are you leaving? I know how much you're making. And I go, look, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it that I'm saving you money because I know what you're spending your money on, amputations, bypass surgery, dialysis, all these things. I'm saving you money and you're penalizing me because I'm spending so much time with the patient. I don't make as much money. So it's it, there's a conflict of interest here. And I go, you know how much money I'm saving you just by educating patients and helping them and supporting them and spending that extra time during my lunch hour or after work or early in the morning? 
And he goes, you're costing us money because we get paid from the government based on diagnosis code. If you prevent the diagnosis code, we don't get paid as much. That's the bottom line. He goes, you're hurting us. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, that's why I'm leaving. I can't handle that. I guess, are we in medicine to make money or we're here to help the patients? And, and it's so frustrating. And even he called me later on and said, you know, Brian, you make good points. Like I don't, I never thought about from the way you are because they were bringing in nurses to upcode, like saying, oh, yeah, this pulse might be down a little bit. Oh, you get paid. You can you can build this much more for a you know decreased peripheral pulses, or you know you get diabetes out of control. You get paid more than controlled diabetes, <laughs> right? So you start looking. It's like okay, so I'm penalizing myself by helping people. It's crazy. It's a crazy idea, and that's why direct primary care is such a, a draw for a lot of doctors now who are burned out, saying I'm not helping anyone. I'm just making money. Is that what I came here for? No one came here just to make money. We want financial stability. That's for sure, but. You know, when we sell out our fellow man to to you know to cross off a box and and not really practice medicine anymore, that's when you lose you lose control of the system. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to something. So Matt, you know, brought up the diabetic foot ulcers, and unfortunately, amputations are way, way, way too common currently, secondary to diabetes. Um, but one thing that, you know, Matt brought up twice is during this week working with Tro, and I learned the same thing when I was here last year prior to starting, is that you have to address, that's like you said, the everything else going on in the life, the relationship to food. And during residency, I was not trained and not prepared or educated on how to actually help people address those other things, address the relationship to food, address the food addiction. And I had a patient during residency who lost one leg second from their diabetes. And by the end of residency, three years later, they had both of their legs gone from diabetes. And, you know, I feel I failed that patient because I educated them on low carb. I educated them on keto, but they couldn't, I was like, well, they can't stick with it, but it's because I did not actually empower them or enable them with fixing that relationship, which was clearly so skewed. And so far, I mean, that if you are wanting to eat those potatoes or the rice or the cakes so much so that you're willing, unfortunately, to lose both of your legs, like that is a super powerful addiction. And so we've got to train people, train the future doctors when someone is fighting up something like that, how do you help them actually reverse that? And that's the type of stuff that is happening here in this clinic, happening at your practice. And that's another educational piece we've got to get out there. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. And and I think the other thing that Tro has nailed on the head that I'm, you know, I just did a Zoom meeting with my patients Wednesday night. And it's amazing because I could sit back and Someone says, I'm struggling with this. And someone said, oh, you know what? Someone who I know was struggling a year ago was saying, you know what I do now? I do this and this and this. But a year ago, they were a disaster. So, you know, to see people helping each other and say, hey, here's the brand of, you know, someone ask about salad dressing. Oh, I make my own. Here's all I do. It's super easy. I do blah, blah, blah. And you'll love it. You're, you, know, you can make your own blue cheese. Make it this way. And, and so, you know, just to see people who are inspired and they feel better and they want to help the next person along, you know. In standard medicine, you can't do that. I always thought about it. I go, how can it be that I can't just, you know, Toro knows from this podcast, we had people that we've helped dramatically that we never met before. They just listen and go, you know, that one guest you had, you know, whoever it is, they impacted me. That 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 their story gave me hope that I could do it if they could do it, you know. And so it's so important that we uh, you know, just just help people however we can because sometimes in Toro, I think you might feel the same way. I have some people I'm like, am I really helping you anymore? I like this is a social meeting once a month where we're just, do you need me? And they, I mean, why don't you fire me? It's like, I need this. I love this and you keep me on track and I love it and I get encouraged and I stay on track. So it's like worth every dime. I'm I'm good doing this. Brian, uh, even I was Tro, talking- even Tro is probably worth it. <laughs> so I was talking to to Matt and Laura about this. You know, right now, if you get into a car accident, first of all, your car has an alarm that goes off if your tire pressure's off, if your engine needs help. It has a service you can call in case something goes wrong, and you can take it into a physical location if something's really, really wrong. If you get a flat tire, somebody's there to help you. You just, a, you know, phone call, text message away. You know, if we can't in, do offer that same level of customer service in uh, and patient care in medicine, we have failed, right? We have failed, right? Right now, you know, find out what's quicker, okay? You call, uh, you get a, you know, you order food or you call a doctor for help. Which one will reach you quicker? Which one will you get quicker? And that tells you about our society, 
right? That tells you about what we are as a profession. We're failures. We have failed as a profession. If you can get, you know, ice cream, deli- fried ice cream delivered to your house quicker than you can get help with your diet or your lifestyle or your overall health, it's a sign that we've failed. If doctors know about billing codes instead of, you know, what is the goal? The goal is reach patients at moment zero, right? Reach patients as close to when they need you as possible, right? So this this concept, it, you know, I think that it really needs to permeate. We need to be able to get that people, like we need doctors to feel accountable. Dr. Matt had mentioned uh, that he, you know, he felt like we should have an auditing system on how we're doing. Like, how do I know if I'm doing as good as Brian out in the West Coast, other than the fact that, you know, everybody tells me I'm the low carb MD host they picked, you know, how would I know? Right. How would I know that? I'm just, <laughs> I know I've lost out a couple of those, you know, Brian, I know they're like, who should I pick that? Well, the same guy. We, with a little more, you we know? talk in my Arizona stuff, but, but that's yeah. the thing. Is, yeah. Yeah. Some people want your, your personality. Some people want my personality. It's, it's just what works for you. Some people want someone, know? a trainer that yells at them and the other one wants someone who's yeah. encouraging them. Right? How so, do we know? How do we know? When you go to a clinic, how well that doctor's, how does the doctor know? How well am I doing compared to the guy down the street? Well, I think, fact, it, like, I think it depends on how tuned in you are and also outcomes. You know, no, we see patients- no, but we're not doing any outcomes, Brian. That's the thing. So right now I could go to a movie theater. I can get ratings on the movie theater and people could tell me exactly about that movie theater. What's good, what's bad. And you, you, you know, there's no ratings on doctor performance. We don't know how good we're doing as a profession. Nobody's held us accountable. And this mindset that Dr. Laura had, which was, I, you know, these are preventable things. What did I do wrong? Right. What could I have done better? Well, I think like, this knows, is the bro. essence of medicine. You know, well, I think that the reality is that we know is if you treat your people well, they stay and you keep your patients and you grow your practice. If you're doing a terrible job, people say, I'm done. I'm not paying for this if you're not helping me when I need it. Right. It's like AAA. If they don't come to your aid when you're really needing, well, why am I paying all this money to you guys for? Right. When they show up at two in the morning when you're on the side of a road and it's raining and they fix your tire, you go, okay, it's worth every dime that I paid for these guys. So it's that. We have to show up and we have to be there and we have to not grow too fast and we have to be uh, accountable. But I think the ultimately, you know, people are paying money for our services. And if we're not helping, and Vice versa also is true. If I have a patient who's just not interested in making lifestyle changes and they're going to keep smoking crack all day and do what they want to do, I was like, okay, I can't really help you. You're wasting my time and I can help someone else. So at some point we kind of, we all have to work together because I have patients who are fantastic and they're all in and they want to be healthy. And like you said, I think Matt said is like, People want to live like they don't think about it at the time, but you want to like, yeah, Rob Sivens, I just talked and he said, I just want to live until I wake up dead one day, meaning like be healthy, fit, be able to not be the last one that everyone has to wait for going up the hill. And you, you can't go to the, you know, the amusement park because you're in a wheelchair, you know, all those kind of things because you, you didn't take care of yourself. No one wants to be that person. But it's hard when you have that cookie in front of you or that addiction in front of you at the moment, you don't care about what's going to happen in five years. It's, it's what you want now. Right. So that's the thing I read about bad habits and good habits. Good habits, you don't see the fruit right away. You have to wait. Bad habits, you get it right now. If you eat the, the cookie and donut, you get that rush right now. And you go, well, maybe I'll be like George Burns and smoke two packs a day and not die, you know, smoke cigars all day and not die until I'm 100. But most likely, you're not going to be that person. So you, you, it's kind of like paying the lotto with your life. Right. So you want to minimize your risk. So if you have bad genetic predisposition to have some of these things and you mitigate your risk and say, okay, I'm going to be as healthy as I can. And if I have bad luck and or bad genes, then so be it. But I'll, if you have bad genes and a bad lifestyle, you're really in bad shape. Yeah. I think, uh, going back to what then what Tro was saying too, I think, uh, in the old paradigm. So the, the direct primary care model where you have it, it, you remove those disincentives to spend time with patients because that's what it is. The When you are in the old paradigm, when you're doing those three to four level visits we just talked about, you are incentivized to see the patient upcharge as much as you can and then see the next patient too. And if you don't, you're going to get a call from your nurse manager or it's just going to be, hey, Brian, you why, why are you, you, you doing this? You're not making as much as the other physician B down the, down the, the clinic over here. So- When you're in that model, the bar is so low. People love physicians a a lot of the times that just listen to them. And that that's a really important part of being a physician. And that's I mean, I do that as much as I can to 
in my residency clinic. Uh, that's I, I, I think I do a good job of that. But when you have these ACOs or you have these other uh, organizations where you have, how many people do you have on a statin? And how many of the level four visits are you going to get? And then you're not looking at the outcomes that truly do matter. Are you, are, how many, where, have you ever seen a metric uh, about a physician who has taken X amount of units of insulin off a patient? Wouldn't that be a good thing for you to know for one of your loved ones that was on insulin? So you could choose a physician in, in whatever state you are. I want to choose a physician that has removed at least 500 unit, units of insulin off of X amount of patients. But that's not out there. And I think that like what Tro was saying, if I was going to go to a mechanic, I don't want to go to a mechanic who has some rear axle like, oh, my rear axle broke after two weeks or, you know, my loved one got an amputation uh, after being in the care for 20 years with this with, with this doctor. And a lot of amputations nowadays are kind of if you don't spend the time that you spend with a the patient, they're kind, they're, that's what happens in the old paradigm. How, how do you know? How, how, how can we not know how many medications a, a, a physician deprescribed? The opposite is true, though. You get in trouble for not prescribing medicines. That's the problem is if you don't prescribe enough medicines, then there's like, wait a minute, how come you're not? You know, I got in trouble. I got a let uh, several times nasty letters. I have a patient with diabetes insipidus and they're saying, how come he's not on anti-diabetic medicines? I'm like, they don't have di this is a different thing like this has nothing to do with that right or my patients whose a1c is now 4.6 that used to be nine now it's 4.6 and they go how come they're not on all these meds for diabetics like they haven't had diabetes by definition for the last two two and a half years why they need those medicines mm -hmm. but it's just a stamp and they no one thinks anymore they just go okay you have this diagnosis you have to be on this and this and this there's a whole list of drugs that we all know that you have to be on once you get diabetes diagnosis you got an ACE inhibitor, you got, you got the uh, statin drug, you got the anti-diabetes medicines, right? And probably some several blood pressure medicines and now another water pill. Now you got, uh, you know, uh, other meds. And, and so that's why it's so frustrating. Like this patient I started off talking about, guess what, Tro? We got our sugars under control. Guess who's not getting up to pee five times a night? How much do you think that affects your anxiety level and stress and all these other things? So now she's laughing more. She's like, she's, she can exercise now. But if you're sleep, you're getting up every hour to pee, because your sugars are so high, guess what? That's going to affect you too. So we all know. And I think the perfect test we should all do is when you're, when you're in your first year of, you know, when you're an intern, put a continuous glucose monitor and watch what your sugars do. When you get a call from the ER at two in the morning, when you just woke up and you're stressed and you're eating cookies, you know, because you're stressed out or you're down in the doctor's lounge. If Tro and I had continuous glucose monitors during that time, our lives would be a lot different because <laughs> we would have said, oh my gosh, we can't be doing this all the time. The long term that I'm still trying to make up for, right, is because of the dumb decisions I made back then, because you're just living in the second. Yeah, my uh, I wore CGMs when I was working in the ED and uh, my cortisol generally kept my uh, sugar about 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter higher than when I was working on the day shift, especially on the night shift. But even even in the ED, you could see when I would go off service and on service. So it's true. This this stress is the stress is real. Yeah, and sleep deprivation, all that stuff, dealing with difficult people. Yeah. So so two things I want to talk about because uh, these, you know, I, I want to just give a sort of compliment to, to, to both of them, uh, both Dr. Laura and Dr. Matt. You know, in my, I've trained I, I countless residents. I've trained countless uh, medical students. I have not met in my career, I don't think, people are who actually, one, um, walk the walk. I mean, the and walk the walk and are, who are so brilliant and so caring. My entire staff, you know, we've gotten to know Dr. Laura over the past year and she's been here before, but my entire staff is like just in awe of how kind they both are, what kind people. And, uh, you know, they, they've got me beat. Not only do they exercise every day, they get up bright and early 5 a.m. or earlier, they're asleep by eight o'clock. Okay. And they eat, I mean, they're, they eat so healthy. They exercise, um, just, you know, and, and their intellect, I got to be honest, and I don't say this often. I mean, they're brilliant. They are both such brilliant, hardworking, actually motivated to learn. I mean, we're like here, like reading the latest studies, talking about them, analyzing them. And it's just so refreshing because you don't see this. And, you know, a little, yeah, I'm a little ashamed to say this, but 
I, Dr. Laura beat me on the obesity medicine boards. So um, definitely super, super smart. Um, and same with Dr. Matt. I mean, he's just, uh, he hasn't taken the obesity medicine boards, but just ridiculously, ridiculously smart. And, uh, you know, talking about CGMs that she's talked about so much, Brian, that's another thing we, you know, we're brainstorming like, and, you know, we just sort of recently launched nationwide CGM access through the app, you know, because, uh, you know, and, and we talk about it. What are the pros? What are the cons? How do we do this right? I mean, and it's so refreshing to be ha- to have here just brilliant people who will not just sort of go with the flow, also challenge like, hey, Tro, you know, did you think about this? Hey, Tro, have we thought about, you know, uh, you know, we're working right now and I can't wait to share this with everybody once it's ready. You know, a, uh, you know, a paper, you know, sort of a review that we'll post on our app about, you know, how do you interpret calcium scores? What do you do when it's when it's hot? You know, how do we interpret medications or is that the time to consider medications and the level of rigor that they put into this, Brian, I swear to God, you'd be like, I would, my, my jaw dropped, you know, my jaw dropped. So I just got to give a compliment. I'm not good at compliments. I compliment Brian all the time, besides the the fact that he's been such a good personal mentor and uh, his age is so advanced. It's amazing. Um, You know, (laughs) but I, you know, these two have impressed me beyond belief. Yeah, because I think there's so many questions. I think that's that's the thing is saying, okay, is this bad? Is this good? What do we do when we see something? We can't just be dogmatic, even though you've been called dogmatic, Troy, I know. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's true. I mean, people are surprised that I'm not as dogmatic as they think I will be about certain things, right? And so, uh, you know, I think it's just really keeping our eyes open and learning and bringing up the next generation to say, okay, like we have to figure this out. If we don't figure this out, the healthcare system's done. And it may be done already, you know, the standard healthcare system when you look at it, because, you know, we're in a top heavy, uh, literally top heavy um, situation where we have fewer, fewer people being born and we have more people with more medical problems and lifestyle is playing a huge role in all that. So we're- Life expectancy is dropping. You Life know. expectancy is actually dropping now, right? We're in trouble. We're we're in trouble. We got to figure it out because, you know, the standard is not working. If you look around and go, food pyramid was great. Okay, show me your evidence. It's a disaster. It just is a disaster. There's no way to argue differently. You have to look around and see what you're seeing. And then, you know, depression, anxiety, stress, all the effects of all these things. And and metabolic health, as we've shown and is is coming through, is that it's really important for mental health. So if we ignore that as part of mental health, we're we're in big trouble. And and the mental health is contributing to the, the obesity rate. So it's all it's all a circle, you know, really. Again, if you're not sleeping and you're stressed and tense and hate the world, it's gonna be tough. And that's what we've seen. That's what we've learned doing this podcast over time. Yeah, I did a I did a residency lecture uh, back in February, and I chose my topic just to be a roundup of the latest information for primary care. And uh, everybody was floored when we went over the new guidelines from the AAP that recommends uh, bariatric surgery for 12 year olds, Uh, less so for now semaglutide for 12 year olds. But I think it just shows you the scope of the problem and how some people uh, like these are these are very smart, intelligent people that sat on a committee and the committee voted unanimously that it is, this is the thing we're going to go with. It's going to be bariatric surgery for 12 year olds. And uh, it's just, people are shocked when they hear that too. Uh, But that's, that's now written into the guidelines. Yeah. Root cause analysis, right? Why is it that we're having so many 12 year olds? We better look and figure out this problem. You can't just throw a bandaid on it. And that's just a temporary bandaid and it's going to be a total disaster, you know? Yeah, maybe they're they're working on their numbers still, so they can't count the calories. They need to, you know, to to tackle childhood obesity, they need to, we need to develop more resiliency in in four year olds. So that's me being sarcastic. Hashtag sarcasm. Same with me. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, the Nutrition Coalition is doing a great job trying to get less sugar implemented into schools, get it less than 6% of calories coming from added sugar. Whereas right now it's much higher and you can see these lucky charm bars are actually allowed as school nutrition and school food. And it's like, this is not, it's not food first, but it's definitely not nutritious. And that's what it's being basically advertised as. And so it's, it's a, 
it, this is going to be a grassroots movement, but it also, at some point, you would hope some guidelines that we're now recommend, recommending bariatric surgery in 12 year olds that the government would change something. But the big food companies are making a ton of money from it. And so it's, it's going to be hard to, it's going to be a tough battle to fight. You have Domino's pizza that has 51% whole, whole grain crust. And whoever thought that was a great idea, pushed it through. And now that's part of the national school lunch program that, that is, that is concordant with the guidelines that you can feed that to kids and it being a healthy meal. You have Lunchables reaching a new contract with the school systems as well. And they're going to push out Lunchables next year. It, even I think we can all agree on at least whole foods. And that is almost exactly what we were going away from with all of the, the food we feed our kids. If nothing else, everybody should be able to agree on giving kids whole foods. And we are promoting newer foods that are basically Franken foods uh, to our kids. And we're signing off on it. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And you'll see different statistics depending on which studies you look at. One recently I was reviewing um, children ages 2 to 19 had an obesity rate of about 13%, and about 40% of those children had fatty liver disease. Non alcoholic fatty liver disease, or now metabolic associated fatty liver disease, is was a disease of adulthood. And previously, it actually it barely existed. Previously, it was really just alcohol driven. Um, would lead to liver disease, cirrhosis, but now it's non alcoholic fatty liver disease from what we're eating. And now children are developing this disease. And that's just a huge rate. Um, and I mean, this is, that should scare people. And that hopefully will scare people into action because um, we need to be doing better about doing something about that. I got one question to before we part ways, Brian. I got one question and I'm going to raise it. You can answer it first and I'll go around. Okay. You have two drugs. Right, you have two drugs, and you got to choose as a doctor. Okay, one drug, one drug has been used for three thousand, sorry, three million years, and is generally well tolerated. Another drug has been used for about seventy years and results in multiple chronic disease. Which drug do you use? It's yeah, I might go with the first one. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna, go with the first one. I'm gonna agree with Brian here. We could ban the second one and still go. We'll go with the first one. I wouldn't ban it. But, you know, I'm a libertarian, so nobody's banning anything on my watch. But, but uh, I, I'm I'm in agreement, guys. Uh, Brian, it's always a pleasure. Maybe we should let the the people smarter than us close us out today. What do you think? Yeah, sounds like a plan to me. Give the last words here. Well, thank you for all the kind words, and it really is an honor to be working with y'all and learning from the Low Carb MD podcast. I never, ha when I first listened to this, how many years ago? I don't know, six years at this point. I mean, it's it's been a while. Uh, did I think that I would be on it talking to you guys and consider you both very good friends? So um, excited to continue this journey and hopefully help reverse chronic disease. I think we're, I think we're all in the right space. We want to, sometimes what we, uh, you know, we do iterative processes. We figure out what works in clinic and what doesn't work. We always move forward. We listen to the science and we do what's best for our patients. And I'm, that's how I know I'm in the right place. Thanks for all our Patreon members. Thanks to people in our practices. Uh, thanks to all the people who've supported us. Brian, I can't tell you how many of my patients are so like happy to hear from you on the podcast and, you know, happy to know that we talk and, you know, they just, they, every day I hear people saying thank you to you and Brian for just being courageous to speak. And I think that that's just, uh, you know, e even that is a, is a value, you know, not just the information, but, be, but having the courage to speak, having the courage to bring on people who, who challenge what we think and how we feel. Um, and just, uh, that's, you know, something you continually give me is that courage to, to keep speaking. Maybe tell me I speak too much, though. Yeah, no, I think it's important. I think it's important to say, hey, let, let's have different voices and let's learn from each other rather than mock each other and ridicule each other and all those things. It's really important because there's people who have different views than us. We can't condone everything everyone says. I don't even agree with myself half the time, right? So sometimes you go, okay, let's reassess this. And I think we have to be able to do that and, and you know, have different viewpoints. Censorship is not the way to move medicine forward. Now, people are saying, well... The science has evolved. 
No, it hasn't. You, you were wrong at the beginning when you say that. You, you never had the science to make the statements you made. So I think a lot of us to say, like Matt's saying, some of the data we don't have yet. We don't know the long-term effects of some things. We just don't have it. I can't tell you what it is if I haven't seen it and we haven't studied it. But here's what we think based on early turnout. So, you know, it's great to have young doctors with good minds who are doing this kind of stuff because that will move everything forward and then we'll learn. And we may reverse ourselves on some things in a couple of years. And if if that's true, then we do. You know, that's just the way medicine gets better and we help people. And so the people who are involved in their health and care, they're going to look out, look up for doctors like us because <laughs> that's what they want. They want to live longer and be healthier and and not be decrepit like that's we don't want to be miserable the rest of our lives. So, you know, even old guys like me can do it so we can all do it. All right. Amen to that. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Matt Calkins, Dr. Laura Buchanan, who's uh, taking patients in our practice. Brian, thank you again. And Brian, I got to chat with you after this. So once we close this, we got to chat. All right, man. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.